From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor and the Eyes Editorial Director. And today we're going to be talking about the challenges facing Iraq's new prime minister, Mustafa al Hadi. And there are a lot of them to discuss, from COVID-19 and the sharp decline in oil prices to long-standing issues like corruption and deteriorating public services, as well as the rivalry between the U.S. and Iran that is occasionally flared up on Iraqi soil. Thankfully, we've got three great guests on the program today to help us make sense of where things stand and where they might be headed. Hafsa Halawa, Shahla Al-Khli, and Yassar al-Maliki. All three are Iraqis and non-resident scholars here at MEI. Hafsa is an independent consultant working on political, social, and economic affairs and development goals across the Middle East, North Africa, and the Horn of Africa. Shahla is an expert in international development and political economy. Yassar is an energy economist and Middle East observer with extensive knowledge of energy, geopolitics, and economics. He's also the managing director of the Iraq Energy Institute in Baghdad. Hafsa, Shahla, Yassar, welcome to the program, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Shahla, let's start with you. For our listeners who might not follow Iraqi politics as closely as the three of you do, can you tell us a little bit about Mustafa al Qadami? What's his background and, and how is he kind of perceived in Baghdad? The new prime minister represents, a, if we can call it, a new set of criteria for prime ministers in Iraq. He represents a turning point from several uh, aspects and points of view. Number one, uh, Mr. Kaudemi, um is an intellectual. He worked heavily during the 90s writing about the atrocities by the dictatorship and, and conveying that to the international community through documentaries at the BBC and other uh, uh, channels. At the same time, he used to write about what's the vision for uh, Iraq as a state, what's the best form of governing structure and governance policies. So he has a more intellectual background, more than pure politics. And that's what uh, differentiates him from uh, all uh, the previous uh, prime ministers who come from solid, um, clear uh, political party, uh, mainly from uh, politicized Islam uh, uh, mainstream and all that. Uh, al Qadami represent a turning point, a different page in Iraqi politics in terms of uh, the criteria of prime minister. And these criteria, it's not an exaggeration if we say that it's been dictated to some extent by the demonstrations and the protests and the public opinion, uh, which turned heavily against using Islam in all its forms and shapes and sectarian um, tools in politics. That's why al Qadimi is viewed to some extent by the public. And uh, I would say from the people I talked briefly uh, the last 10 days in Baghdad, he's viewed as a turning point, a change. However, given all the history of optimism and then a great disappointment, Iraqis are still uh, skeptic. He also, through his writings, uh, believed in some sort of decentralization, and he was one of the big supporters for Prime Minister uh, Haider Abadi in 2015 when he announced uh, the reform policy starting with decentralization. Uh, he, of course, um, has strong relations with the Kurdish leadership. Um, as usual with Iraqi politics, it's all personal, not institutionalized yet. But these personal relations can be a good starting point in order to move ahead with his vision also about federalism. To sum up, he doesn't come to Iraqis or viewed by Iraqis with any type of baggage. He is as he is. And adding to the uh, fact that he uh, was the head of the intelligence apparatus since 2016, this also added a little bit of charisma, a little bit of something deeper than what he shows on TV. That's what people see in him. He might know something else. He might up to something else, which is different from what the mainstream politics or the regular Iraqi uh, politics, uh, political context. So the views are in general are positive, but still very shaky because Iraqis lost the trust in the political process, and it's his main 
goal and role, and it should be its main objective to save the Iraqi state from uh, the current disintegration is to rebuild this trust with the Iraqi uh, public. Yassar, why was Al-Qadami able to succeed where his two predecessors as prime minister-designate failed? What was, what was different this time around? Well, um, th- there are two main reasons here to, to think about. Um, the first one is more of uh, environmental. So th- there have been different circumstances throughout the designation process uh, after the resignation of uh, Adil Abdel Mahdi's government. Um, so throughout these months, since the beginning of the year, uh, we had lots of political um, situations that developed uh, due to incidents in the country. Also, we had uh, the lower oil prices on the back of the COVID-19 pandemic. We had an economic crisis that the country has started to get into. We had a health crisis where you know we had curfews and so on. And also, we started to see a number of security incidents um, starting. So in a way, uh, the environment changed throughout the months of designation. So this is the main factor, the first one. The second one, uh, we have to look at the personality of Mr. Kalami himself. I think Shahla has covered this quite extensively uh, when it comes to the background and the history of Mr. Kalami. But also, we have to... Uh, do a comparison with the other two designates. So starting with Muhammad uh, Tawfiq Alawi, um, many saw uh, Mr. Alawi as a foreign entity coming into this process. Mr. Alawi was brought in from outside the political process. He was supported by a single faction um, and his approach was viewed as something that is untraditional and unorthodox within the circles of elitism and so on. Um, And this caused him uh, many troubles and bumps along the way. From the beginning, he couldn't get the Sunnis and the Kurds to agree to uh, be part of his cabinet. He couldn't get the whole uh, Shia house uh, in agreement. Um, And and he was, again, seen as being the candidate of a single faction. Um, Then uh, we had Mr. Zerfi. Mr. Zerfi, uh, in a way, was a rejected candidate by the Iraqi Shia political house itself. And this is given uh, his uh, history as the governor of Negev. Uh, There had been lots of problems with many different uh, entities in Negev itself and also within the Shia political class. As as what Shehla said, there are lots of personal problems usually. There are good personal relationships, but also personal problems. And that could affect uh, things uh, on the long on the long run. So focusing on Mr. Kalami himself, uh, Kalami is, is is a compromise candidate. By the end of the day, he's not foreign to the political process. Um, he has a established networking and relationship development skills. I believe he has been uh, positively utilizing his position as the head of the Iraqi intelligence service uh, to increase those wide connections, uh, give favors when needed, and also extend his networking capacity to the different uh, power actors in the country. And whether those are Sunnis, uh, Shias, or kids, and he has been quite successful uh, in that. Now, we need to understand one thing. Throughout this quite hectic process of designation, nomination, and so on, uh, Kalami's name was actually being discussed uh, in private circles and behind the scenes since the government resignation back in November and December. And we saw his name coming out on lists on social media and so on. And of course, I think everybody knows in Iraq, we have this process of card burning, uh, where they would put a number of candidate names and see what kind of a backlash, uh, try to assess the uh, public outcry or uh, reception of such names. And his name was put there. Initially, he faced a backlash from elements that were very close to Iran. But again, given the main factor that I started with, which is the change in circumstances, there had been some pressure on political elitists, on uh, on the political class in Iraq. There are many socioeconomic dynamics that are changing because of uh, the economic situation and so on. And moderate elements, uh, even within the Iranian camp, they came in to support Mr. Kadami. Now, some people do speak of a some sort of a deal between Tehran and Washington that brought in Mr. Kalami. But then again, this is speculation. We have nothing to prove. And this is how we came to be here today. Also, looking at the makeup of his cabinet, what stands out for you? What are your kind of key takeaways? Thanks, Alistair. Um, It's a pleasure to be uh, invited uh, again. 
Um, it's, uh, it's a very mixed bag, I think, in terms of responding. I think there's two parts to it. One is the process that got us to the current cabinet in terms of the vote. I think something that's significant to highlight is the fact that both the Minister of Interior and the Minister of Defence were, you know, were approved and appointed in the first cabinet uh, voting session that we had, uh, which in the past we've seen, particularly with Adil Abdel Mahdi and his cabinet formation, uh, you know, these positions tend to be some of the most contentious within the cabinet discussions. I think it's it's twofold. Um, as people, I think people's memory is slightly you know, can be slightly short when it comes to Iraq at times because we have this renewed sense of incredible optimism around Mustafa Qadmi and this cabinet and this formation process and and the way we got here. And the reality is is that we've had this uh, sense of euphoria before, not just at times of government formation, but also at at various points. You know, I I remember this euphoria leading into the 2018 elections and after it as well, post the the recovery and post the retaking of territory from from ISIS. And so there needs to be a sense of caution in terms of the cabinet itself without going into too many names. Of course, the standout name is the, uh, some people will call it the return, some people will call it the welcome introduction of, of, of Dr. Ali Alawi at the Ministry of Finance. He's also temporarily in charge of the uh, oil portfolio as well. Um, just an incredibly revered and respected academic and, and people who know him well speak so highly of him and, and very well respected within the entire political elite. So that is definitely a positive. And to highlight uh, just a couple of major negatives that have come out of this process, we have only one woman of the 15 confirmed ministers, um, a former minister within the KRG, would be of great benefit from Mustafa Kadmi in looking at filling the seven empty ministries that we do still have to really look for, for strong women, uh, both Arab and Kurdish uh, um, Iraqis, to fill that role. It's something that is very important, sends a strong message on the social agenda, which, to be fair, uh, looking at the discussion on predecessors, um, Adnan Zorfi did very well in terms of looking at women and and the Ministry of Women's Affairs or or Women and Family Affairs and and the women that he suggested for his cabinet. And, of course, the major gap that we're missing, seven major portfolios, um, of which in particular oil and foreign affairs are massive and certainly need um, you know, we we would like to see those positions filled with competent ministers that can, you know, last out. And it's just a reminder that we're still using the same process of political jockeying. You know, this cabinet is not formed in any real material way different to any of the others that we've seen. Although there is, I think, a genuine uh, popular uh, rallying behind the current prime minister. Shahla, what do Al Khadmi's initial moves tell us, and what do we know about his agenda going forward? Uh, of course, he started with popular moves, uh, moves that really uh, built uh, the trust with Iraqis. Number one, he brought back uh, General Abdul Wahab Saadi and actually promoted him to head the Iraqi anti uh, counterterrorism forces, and that's a very important and big plus for. Uh, his uh, cabinet uh, during the first week. Going to Hafsa's point, also the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry of, of Defense, uh, uh, as she will explain that, it's the first time that these two ministries are filled within the first uh, round of voting. And that also takes us to another step of building a trust with the Iraqis. When you bu- you bring the chief of army staff, uh, General Uthman al Ghanimi, uh, to oversee the Ministry of Interior, that means he wants to take back the control of the Iraqi streets from the militias and from the non-state actors. And that's a very strong message. And that's a a very important starting point in his process or program to contain the uh, non-state actors and militias' role in Iraqi politics and in Iraqi government structures. Uh, In terms, uh, he did also some... um, 
um, if we call it popular or populist visit by visiting the uh, an institution for retirement. Um, uh, though this institution is responsible about pay, paying the salaries, the combination of meetings with Iranian and American uh, ambassadors on the same day, almost um, uh, the video is being released almost at the same time. That's another important message. Also, the meetings with the head of NATO, the EU, the Russian, all these uh, Arab ambassadors as well, all this to show, to send a regional and international message. But these messages are not actually to the uh, regional players or international players. It's all directed to Iraqi people who look for a more balanced relations, regional or international. The last of his visits is to visit the Ministry of Defense uh, and also to visit the uh, counterterrorism forces headed by General Abdel Wahab Saad. These two institutions are viewed by Iraqis to be uh, to have been marginalized by the militias and by pro-Iranian factors and viewed by Iraqis as uh, the symbol of how Iraqi institutions being marginalized for the sake of empowering militias and other pro-Iranian factors in the Iraqi politics. And Iraqis have used this, that this, this is the main source of tilting power toward uh, the Iranian influence. So by empowering these two institutions. It's also um, another step in, in terms of building a trust with Iraqis. Yes, sir. Iraq is facing a pretty dire economic situation at the moment. How is the prime minister likely to try to navigate the twin challenges of COVID-19 and the impact of low oil prices? And how much international support will be needed? Well, just to start with with a few numbers, uh, Iraq is quite dependent on on oil. Um, these are three numbers that we usually always discuss when it comes to Iraq. So, oil makes ninety nine percent of exports. Oil makes up more than ninety percent of government uh, revenues, and at the same time, it contributes more than sixty percent to the overall GDP of the country. Um, so, dependence is unquestionable. Now, what we have seen in the in the last few weeks is that Iraq is building high hopes on the OPEC plus deal to bring back higher oil prices, at least in its uh, first phase to maintain and bring back the oil price to 30. And hopefully on the second phase would uh, bring it to high 30s and low 40s. Uh, now, the impact has been great on Iraq. In uh, January, income monthly income Income was uh, more than six billion, was six point sixteen uh, billion dollars a month. By April, we have seen that reducing by almost seventy seven percent to one point four billion. Um, so this is quite problematic, and and this is one of the biggest problems that the prime minister has to uh, face on the short term. Now. Just continuing from where Hafsa and Shehla have have uh, have stopped. So, uh, one of the immediate things that uh, Prime Minister Kadami has done was creating this economic uh, cell uh, that basically will take uh, decisions. It's an emergency cell that takes economic decisions, and he headed it, which is something uh, not seen before because previously we had deputies for the Prime Minister, economic and uh, energy affairs deputies. Now he has taken. Uh, responsibility by becoming uh, head of that cell. At the same time, he has replaced uh, Mr. Ali Alawi, who is a um, uh, quite a respected uh, uh, figure in, in, in economics and uh, development in the country. Uh, he has replaced him as a deputy uh, heading those those uh, meetings. So this is this is one of the immediate things that he has done. But just to focus on this point, there are three main challenges that we need to look at. So there is the economic challenge. And there is the healthcare sector challenge. And of course, there is the security challenge. So when it comes to the economic impact, um, the government has not yet passed that um, um, federal budget that is greatly needed for uh, keeping the country running. Uh, traditionally, 75%, up to 80% of expenses, uh, government uh, spending is uh, comes from oil. Uh, only 10 to 15% comes from non-oil revenues. Uh, with the closing down of the economy, with the curfews, with the slowdown, that is global, not just uh, you know Iraq, uh, uh, an Iraqi uh, domestic concern, uh, we see most of the expected uh, $16 billion um, for 2020 being erased by that. 
now there are lots of pressures on the government to bring back uh, the economy, to get activity going, to ease the curfews, to do partial lifting. And, and this has been done, but this is also being reconsidered by uh, the government from time to time to see what happens. Overall, the next three to four months economically are very important. Iraq has a number of fiscal buffers. They are not as great as other neighboring countries or GCC economies, but uh, they may soften the impact. So one, Iraq is trying to restructure its credit lines, is trying to retrieve deposited, uh, sorry, deposited collaterals uh, with creditors, export to credit agencies, and so on. Uh, Iraq is also negotiating a two to three billion IMF uh, loan package, also maybe some support from the World Bank, and this is where uh, U.S. government support may become um, important. Also, Iraq is utilizing its uh, foreign exchange reserves for two reasons. One, protecting the Iraqi dinar, and two, to issue uh, domestic uh, debt, and that could help the government to um, keep on uh, working. Just just to keep some numbers in perspective, internal debt in Iraq is around 32 Point four uh, billion, while external debt is seventy two point eighteen billion. So overall, Iraq has a debt to GDP ratio of forty seven percent, which is not bad, but not a great for a country like Iraq that is um, dependent on oil revenues. So this is the first. This is the first problem that Iraq uh, is facing that uh, the prime minister has to deal with. The second one is the healthcare system. So Iraq did react early to the pandemic, uh, given that it is quite close to a epicenter, which is uh, Iran, uh, but also at the same time, Iraq suffers from poor infrastructure capacity. So the World Bank puts the numbers at 1.4 beds for every 1,000 citizens. Other estimates put it at around 1.2 beds for every 1,000 citizens. Just to make sure we understand these numbers, in a place uh, like Italy, which was hardly hit by the pandemic, they have 3.2 beds per 1,000 citizens. But Iraq is still managing with whatever um, available resources they have. Uh, lastly, the security impact. Now, um, Mustafa al-Kadami has aimed for um, consolidating the Iraqi security forces uh, and the government um, without compromising its current structure. Uh, also, he, he has aimed to and promised to ensure arms are uh, controlled and uh, under the state. But what the situation shows right now that there is a resurgence of ISIS in northern Iraq, especially what we have seen two weeks ago in Samarra and Saladin provinces. There were some major attacks that were repelled by elements of the Ministry of Interior as well as uh, the PMU uh, factions. Also, there had been some incidents in Kabul province uh, and so on. So these are the three main challenges that the country is facing uh, because of the COVID-19 crisis, because of uh, the lower oil prices. And this is what uh, Mr. Kaldami will have to face and focus on in the intermediate period. Shahla, in a piece you wrote recently, you said there were some promising early signs when it comes to relations between Baghdad and Erbil, that is between the federal government and the Kurdistan regional government. Where do things stand and, and what are the prospects for a breakthrough on that front? The early signs, uh, number one, the Kurds were among the first uh, political uh, components to publicly and formally announce their support to uh, the then prime minister designate uh, Mustafa al kadhimi And that's built a good rapport uh, with, uh, with the prime minister. That's number one. Of course, in addition to the historical and personal relations between uh, Prime Minister Academy and the Kurdish leadership, that will also play a role in terms of one important thing, to bring everyone into the negotiation table without strong uh, preconditions or without steering the conversation to very controversial and very complicated uh, issues. So, he will be able to do that based on uh, two main factors. Number one, both uh, Baghdad government, the federal government, and the regional government, the Kurdistan regional government, both governments are facing almost the same challenges. Public uh, unrest about uh, the uh, possibility of losing uh, the public employees' salaries, the economic hardship, and all that. Both governments want to avoid having public unrest or political unrest in their, in their area. This is the first time that Baghdad also is suffering from uh, strong uh, or uh, economic hardship. It's not only Kurdistan, uh, which means that uh, Baghdad cannot 
uh, just drag the situation and make Kurdistan suffer more. Both of them, they should solve the financial issues uh, very quickly. The breakthrough uh, we can divide based on these main and first signs of rapprochement between Baghdad and Erbil. Based on that, uh, Prime Minister Karimi has, I think, two uh, types of decisions, short-term decisions, which are very tactical. Number one is to secure the salaries, full salaries, uh, to and promise that to KRG's uh, employee. That will be an in, uh, will have an enormous impact on the Kurdish leadership vision for the second round of negotiation. I would add also. Uh, he took uh, an important decision in in his second uh, uh, Council of Ministers uh, session. He ordered the Ministry of uh, Oil and the Council of Ministers to revisit the draft of the hydrocarbon law and try to expedite the process the process of legislating the hydrocarbon law, which is one of the main obstacles uh, uh, that challenge the institutionalization of the relations between the Kurdistan regional government and the federal government in terms of managing the oil and gas sector. This uh, hydrocarbon law is being pending since 2005 with ups and downs. So the idea that in his second session, uh, uh, instructed to revisit the draft and try to expedite the process of uh, legislating this law, it's very promising for the court. It all, it's very good sign uh, for the court. The, these are short term. These are very tactical step. I think the real step and real negotiation about, as I said, the institutionalization between the two governments will start by the beginning of 2021, because the remaining of 2020, as Yasser uh, explained, there are many challenges that face both governments, and both governments need to take tactical uh, steps and tactical agreements to address them. So the major breakthrough between the federal government and the KRG is the salaries for the six, uh, for the next six months? If this agreement happens, and for the next six months the KRG's employees get their salaries without being politicized by Baghdad or the populist agenda, that will be an important positive point that will be paid back in in the negotiation about Kirkuk and other issues, which I think it will be by uh, 2021, because another tactical issue that important for Prime Minister Karimi is to contain and constrain uh, the role of non-state actors and militias in Iraq. And they, he will, for that, he will need the support of the Kurdistan regional government as well. So the next six months, he will be focusing on the rest of Iraq. But I think by next year, it will be more uh, substantial decisions and issues to be taken into consideration with the KRG. Also, one of the other major variables at play here is Iraq's protest movement. It started last October and has been on hold in recent weeks because of the pandemic and the government's lockdown, but has recently started back up again. Does the movement have the same influence it did a few months ago, and how do you see that dynamic evolving? Well, obviously, throughout the, not just the COVID-19, but this arduous process to form a government over the last sort of three, four months in the country has meant that the protest movement has inevitably lost momentum. You know, targeting messages towards these political actors has, you know, it's had to morph itself, it's had to try and insert itself into negotiations. And you've had different piecemeal offerings from different prime minister designates and and that continuous cycle of... of um, of negotiation and, and where they fit into that circle has inevitably weakened the movement as a whole. I think in terms of where it goes here and, um, you know, just to point out that renewed protests when new actors come in and there are new targets to effectively, you know, be able to channel messages and anger isn't really anything new. And it's it's really not surprising at all that we've seen a kickstarting or a restarting of the movement. I think what's emerging within the movement is a, a natural fracture within the priorities for social unrest. You know, Mustafa Kadhmi is not 
by any stretch a, an incredibly unpopular figure. He's not a figure that generates a lot of anger specifically. So there's a great reasonable amount of, of will to, to let him, you know, to see this through and see what happens under his leadership. He's also given some great overtures to the movement uh, in his first package of decisions, deciding to or announcing the immediate release of protesters who've been in detention since October 1st, protesters who've been convicted with light sentences, ordering the courts and the prosecutor's office to, to release them and opening up this commission for accountability. And accountability has really been the core protest message that has galvanized so much of the movement for the last four or five months, as soon as it began to get incredibly violent in terms of the state-sponsored response. I think part of the um, sort of the, the focus we need to look at when we're looking at this protest movement, assessing its fractures, different priorities, you know, the movement or not the movement, but a protest movement in Basra, for example, does differ significantly in terms of its makeup, target, focus and desires than, than say, across the wider uh, south, effectively. Um, and uh, that will become more apparent as the movement stops, starts, uh, generates uh, momentum, loses it and so on and so forth. I think the important thing to remember here is that we have become... Uh, very uh, tuned to um, expecting protest movements to become massive national uh, bastions of political change. We've expected over the last decade in the MENA region that protest movements will immediately morph into political movements and, and that there is this greater path of, of uh, identity that they will go on. And the reality is, is that in most parts, you know, so a social unrest is social unrest for that reason, for certain demands, for certain, uh, you know, uh, certain things that they want to see in a new government. There may not necessarily be a political nature or desire from this movement. There may be actors within it that go on to become political actors, but we have to stop looking at them directly through the lens of if they don't morph into this massive political movement, then it's ultimately a failure. Social unrest will be a part of Mustafa Kadhimi's uh, tenure as prime minister, as it would be anybody else had they come in and been successful without the uh, requisite decisions taken to be able to quell anger, respond to demands. And I think Shahala made a great point that, you know, this prime minister, more than any prime minister in the past, dealing with challenges, not necessarily just for the enormity of the challenge, but because of the state, the political landscape that he now embodies, has much less time than the other um previous formations and iterations of government that we've seen. And, and the social unrest will continue to be a reminder of that. Before we wrap up, I'd like to get all of your final thoughts on where you see things heading going forward. Shahla, where do you see things going from here? Do you think the new government will be able to make progress on the issue of decentralization, for example? It's um, it's not uh, another foreseeable in the next six months that Prime Minister Academy will be able to uh, go ahead again and reactivate, if we can call it this way, reactivate the decentralization process. But based on Prime Minister Academy's background and, and vision for the best governing structure for Iraq, and if the populist agenda uh, will be contained by end of 2020, um, I would think that uh, decentralization will be on top of his agenda uh, for 2021 because there are just mere uh, de facto dynamics and variables on the ground in Iraqi provinces that it doesn't allow the government to re-centralize uh, anymore. Decentralization is the solution for most of the demands that's uh, been in Maysan or Diqar or Basra or all these uh, provinces because they want a more reliable and more uh, uh, government that can address their demands directly and the central government cannot do that anymore. So, how about you? What's what's next for Iraq, and what will you be watching particularly closely over the coming months? Iraq is going through a drastically difficult economic situation. I think this is something we have pressed on throughout this podcast. Um, now, we need 
to watch the dynamic uh, of Tehran and Washington in the country uh, in the next few months. Many believe Mr. Kadami is supported by the United States. It's not a secret. It's an open secret, actually, in Baghdad. And the U.S. has dived back into the political and economic mess uh, of Iraq. However, betting all chips on Kadami, uh, this is this is Washington's last bet at a pro-Western Baghdad. Um, and also, it is still not clear uh, for now what the U.S. is expecting in return. Also, it is not clear how the U.S. is going to help Iraq economically. And this is something we need to watch. We have seen what they have done before uh, supporting the Abadi government. There is a playbook there where the U.S. government guaranteed bonds, uh, created credit loans for Iraq, supported Iraq militarily and and security-wise. But still, by the end of the day, as written in in our analysis uh, at the MEI, Iraq is right now too hot to toss around between both parties. I think Tehran is watching from afar and waiting for the U.S. to fail uh, in the country. Afsa, you've got the uh, the last word here. How optimistic are you about the prime minister's prospects moving forward? I think that we have to remind ourselves that whilst certain challenges, notably economically, are exacerbated because of the COVID-19 pandemic and its effect on global markets, the large majority of the challenges that where the Prime Minister faces are by no means new, and they are by no means challenges as a fallout of the oil prices and and the pandemic and so on. These are long-lasting, deep-seated, deep-rooted issues. And what I'm looking for, I think, in this Prime Minister is his political courage. I think what he's shown in the last few days, in the last sort of the week since he came into uh, as an officially appointed Prime Minister, is that he is willing to, at least in terms of public relations, he's definitely willing to do things differently. Something I always argued that Adil Abdel Mahdi, the Prime Minister, and either, you know, you can give him the benefit of the doubt and said he couldn't utilize that leverage, or you could say he didn't want to. Um, you know, there is a leverage in being a quote unquote technocratic prime minister with no political backing per se in that you can call out the political parties when bills come to parliament that don't get voted on publicly. Mustafa Kadhmi has the power to and the the um, the space to say, this is what I've done and they're not moving on this, whether it's economic, social um, or, or security wise. And, you know, we will see in the coming few months just how much political courage he has to really take the blocks, the political blocks to task on their inability to make uh, decisions in Parliament uh, in so much as that is the power that he has. So the jury's out, let's say. We'll have to leave things there for now, but Hafsa, Yassar, Shahla, thank you all for joining the program today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. And thank you as well to our listeners for tuning in and to our production team for their work on today's program. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.